to make the introductions to her guest. So Emma is going to be doing the interviews this afternoon. So ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause for Emma Jones. And I'm going to hand you the mic and you can introduce Richard. Thank you very much, Dave. Oh, what a lovely crowd. <laughs> Hands up if you're a small business owner. Okay. Hands up if you're not. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. We might come on to that then in terms of uh, who you are if you're not a small business owner at SME 2017. But welcome to everyone. Uh, I've been hearing this is the first year of this show, the first day of the first year. So I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Um, as Dave said, my name is Emma Jones. Uh, I run a business called Enterprise Nation. Uh, we offer support to help people start and grow their own small business. Uh, we are on stand P36, uh, but I think actually we go straight from this session into networking drinks. So uh, hopefully you'll join us for that. Uh, but I am very delighted that um, it's not going to be about Enterprise Nation this talk. Um, it's going to be... I was just saying to somebody outside, uh, one of the regions, if not the UK's best entrepreneurs who's agreed to spend some time with us this afternoon. Uh, so he is an incredible entrepreneur. He's going to tell us a little bit about how it started, uh, his plans for ongoing growth, how indeed he's kind of got to this point. Um, but just a couple of statistics on this person, because I still can't believe that one person sort of in one entity can deliver quite so much. So uh, Richard's company, which is a business called HomeServe, it's based locally in Warsaw. Uh, they have less, just less than 8 million customers, uh, which I think is staggering. Uh, their turnover in the past year was just under 800 million pounds. Uh, and this is the gentleman who started and founded the company. Operates on three continents. So I'm going to be asking Richard some questions about how he did get started, all of that growth, and then we will open up for questions just before we do go for a drink. But ladies and gentlemen, the incredible entrepreneur, please welcome Mr. Richard Harpin. Come and join me here. So this is going to feel a bit like on the sofa with Oprah, but like in a non-private environment. <laughs> so hopefully we've got the whole show who we might attract in if we, uh, if we talk loud enough. So Richard, welcome. Thank you so much for sparing your time. Thanks, Emma. Um, so I want to start, Richard. I kind of went through these stats of just less than 8 million customers and just under 800 million turnover. Um, but you started your first business when you were 15. Uh, you then started a couple of other businesses, still when a teenager. So take us kind of back to the beginning in terms of, I guess, what was it that made you think, I've got a thirst for entrepreneurship and starting my own business? Um, it, it was going back to when I was uh, four years old and um, I was born in uh, Huddersfield in West Yorkshire. And uh, on a Sunday, a uh, helicopter used to come and land in the garden of the big house at the end of my cul-de-sac and uh, my father would lift me onto his shoulders and uh, we'd look at this helicopter landing and I remember saying, Dad, I want one of those. And he said, uh, well, work hard, son. Uh, probably you'll need to run your own business. And um, I found out a few years later that it was Lord Hanson flying in to have uh, Sunday lunch with his parents that lived in the big house at the end of the cul-de-sac. And uh, that was my motivation age four for uh, wanting to be an entrepreneur. I just love the fact that you can still remember that at the age of four, that's what you thought. I'm sure a lot of four-year-olds say, I want a helicopter. Are we allowed to say to people that you actually have achieved that in terms of you have got one? So, Richard, if you do Google Richard, one of the first results that always comes up is that he does fly into Walsall almost every day in the home serve helicopter. So, brilliant that you've achieved it. So, you'd started these businesses when you were young, but actually then you did have a career as such. So, you work for the likes of Procter & Gamble and then Deloitte's. Did you feel that you needed the training and the foundation that companies like that could give you before then starting your big success story? Um, I, I think it did help, but actually probably helped in um, the later stages of developing HomeServe, uh, the experience from P&G in Deloitte. Um, I think really uh, the big experience was um, setting up my um, original couple of businesses. So... Um, uh, the first one was mail order fly tying materials, uh, set up from my uh, bedroom at home, uh, age 15. Um, and I thought the best form of market research is uh, placing an advertisement in a national fishing magazine 
Uh, it cost me eight pounds, and I thought if I place the ad, I'll then see how many people uh, ring up to get a mail order catalog. Uh, internet didn't exist in those days, and um, about a hundred people rang, rang up and uh, said we're actually just out of print of the uh, the catalog uh, so very quickly printed one uh, bought in all the materials and set up my uh, mail order fishing tackle business and um, uh, the only drawback with that was that uh, i never saw any of my customers so decided that i go to the uh, the national game fair every year and uh, that was a three-day show with about a hundred thousand fishermen that went and that was my first experience of meeting the customers face to face and um, out of that experience came my uh, second business so um, uh, the wives and girlfriends and sisters of all these fishermen said uh, oh those fishing flies would make nice earrings because they were multicolored, uh, big fluffy ostrich feathers so that was the market research done for my uh, second business. And um, so literally all we did was cut off the end of the hook, add kidney wires to the, uh, the fishing flies, and then needed to decide uh, what are we going to call these um, high fashion uh, fishing fly earrings. So I came up with the name Danglers. And... Uh, brilliant but uh, somebody said uh, that's a terrible name that uh, infers something unseemly and organic <laughs> and uh, they proceeded to recommend that we use the name hookers <laughs> so um, uh, the next stage was then uh, deciding how do we sell these earrings and the target market was teenage girls uh, where do teenage girls go uh, to hair salons so we had a card of earrings attached to the till in hair salons and I got no money for uh, advertising or marketing so I went out to the big um, uh, hairdressing salon reps that would sell um, shampoos and all the um, uh, scissors and all the hairdressing paraphernalia to these hair salons and said, uh, leave a card of earrings with uh, some of your uh, top salons. And um, so they did that. Uh, we then put out a press release saying, hookers set to hit the high streets. And, uh, by which time I was age 17 and um, uh, got loads of free publicity. Uh, every radio station, every TV program, uh, hookers set to hit the high streets and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. They said teenage girls are buying these earrings uh, because TV was saying that they did. And um, uh, the business did really well for nine months and then sort of died. Uh, I then went on to uh, 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 buy houses in the north of England uh, and uh, rent them out. And there's about 15,000 pairs of earrings that are still in the loft of my first rented house in Newcastle. And I think any day now, somebody's going to go into the loft, one of the tenants, just as these earrings come back into fashion again 20 years later. I love that. 15,000 hookers in the northeast. You heard it here <laughs> at SME 17. Um, we're going to come on about customer service and kind of routes to market later. But one thing um, you've always said, still on that kind of background, born in Huddersfield, that as a good Yorkshireman, keeping costs low has always been something that's important to you. You're now at a huge size of a company. Is that still something that runs through your veins? Uh, not really. No, I think uh, my focus is on uh, growth. Uh, it's on marketing. It's on... Uh, uh, the big one is customer service um, and I've sort of let other people worry about efficiency and cost and try to say let's, uh, let's just make sure we're delivering great service at whatever that cost to deliver that 
and out of that, together with great marketing, we will uh, will grow the business. Okay, and just going back again to the beginnings of the business, so you went to South Staffordshire Water, so the idea came because you were looking for the services of a plumber, you thought, I think there's a gap in the market here. Why did you not just start the business yourself? Why the pitch to South Staffordshire Water? Um, well, by this time, I'd uh, left Deloitte, still didn't know what the big idea was, and thought, uh, let's set up my own management consultancy. So um, did that with a, with a business partner, and uh, my very first client was a little water company uh, just based up the road from here, uh, about half an hour away, and uh, it was South Staffordshire Water. And they said, um, uh, come in and do a bit of consultancy work. We think there's an idea in a plumbing service and we're a regulated water company, uh, that part of the business is not going to grow, so we want to develop non-regulated activities. So this was back in uh, um, Christmas of 1992. Uh, I did about an eight-week study, looked at the market, uh, identified real customer need, a worry from homeowners about rogue tradesmen, big repair bills, rip off in the pipeline, uh, lots of horror stories about particularly older homeowners not being able to get a reputable tradesman. So that was the idea. Um, I wrote a business plan, a five-year plan, and it said uh, this business can break even in the first year, make a million pounds profit in year five, uh, it will require £100,000 worth of investment and uh, let's set it up as a joint venture between me and my business partner and South Staffs Water. So in April uh, 93, they said, uh, great, uh, let's do it. And I thought, oh shit, um, a five-year plan, uh, they've said they want to do it and um, so set the business up and um, every month it grew. We were largely getting work through uh, the water company call center and Yellow Pages. Every month the business grew the revenue and every month the, uh, the business lost more money. So it was a big experience of don't try and grow a business to profitability. We got a model that didn't work. By the end of the first year, uh, the water company said, hold on a minute, you told us that uh, uh, the limit to our investment would be £100,000. You've burnt through half a million pounds of our money and uh, we don't think this business is going to work. We're going to um, close it down. Well, you can't just leave it at that. What happened then? <laughs> uh, so uh, all of my friends and colleagues were saying, uh, this was your final chance, Richard. Uh, I think you better go back and work for Deloitte or Procter & Gamble. And I thought uh, my life's dream from a child was uh, I need to run my own business and make it work. I'd had a couple of goes early in life that I told you about. So this was my last shot. So I couldn't walk away. I had to stay and make it work. And... Uh, searched around in the UK to try and find a business model that would work because uh, the one that we'd got clearly wasn't working. Uh, I came across a little water company in Sutton, in Surrey, and they were running a plumbing insurance scheme, charging the customers £50 a year to cover the underground water pipe in the garden. And they got 30,000 of their 100,000 customers signed up. So I remember sitting in the Holiday Inn in, uh, in Surrey, interviewing in market research 10 of their customers, and they said, it's great. Uh, we love the service, but why can't they also cover my internal plumbing and my block drains, not just the water pipe in my garden? So we copied the product, put the extra bits in, and sent out a, um, a hundred, a thousand leaflets and 38 people sent in the money, their 50 pounds. 
a 3.8% take up from direct mail. And so from desperation, this business is about to close to 38 people joining up. Uh, I remember we had about 20 staff by the end of the first year. Uh, I got on my desk and said, yes, I think we've made it. And so we sent out 100,000 mail shots. It, this was really amateur. It was a cartoon leaflet, uh, but it worked. We sent out 100,000 leaflets. We got the same 3.8% take-up rate. Uh, we then signed up every water company in the country on what we called a sort of uh, affinity marketing agreement. And um, the business grew like mad. Uh, by year five, instead of the, uh, the million pounds profit that I thought we'd make, the business was making uh, seven million profit. Would you therefore say from that kind of what that taught you is, if anyone's here thinking maybe my model isn't quite right, should I stop, should I give up, you would essentially say keep on going until you perfect that model. Research what others are doing, look around, be open to new ideas, but keep going to perfect it. Absolutely, I think, um, but doing it small scale. So I'm a big believer in uh, copying others. So uh, second mover advantage, I've never been clever enough to copy or to come up with a big business model that I've invented, but a few examples of copying other business models that are working, trying to improve upon them, and then testing them to make sure they work. Once you're happy that they are working, uh, then to think big and uh, with a sense of urgency so to uh, really make it happen. And just on that, so you say that kind of by year five there was more profit coming in, but when you first started, when you'd got the model right, did you ever envisage that HomeServe would one day be this big? And I know you're still going for growth. Did you envisage that one day you would be running a business valued at over a billion, you're still a majority shareholder? Was that always the plan? No, I think it was, you go in phases and you say, uh, I really want to have a successful business, but I don't know how big that's going to be. To uh, crisis, survival, uh, we've had four or five major issues in the history of the business and fortunately overcome uh, all of those. And then you say, let's go on to uh, think even bigger. And so never thought, where's it going to be eventually? Just let's get over the next hurdle and uh, keep growing, keep bringing in great people, coming up with new ideas, and uh, hopefully it will keep growing. Okay, and it has. So let's just talk about those great people, because I know this is another big thing that you believe in, is that if you're kind of saying, I'm not an expert in everything, but I'll bring in good people who are. When you look to recruit people, maybe kind of again back in the early days, what kind of characteristics do you look for when you're thinking, I want to recruit people onto a great team? Uh, I think in the early days, it was not even thinking what's the right cultural fit or what are the characteristics. Um, it was, uh, I'm not a great believer in uh, headhunters. Hope there aren't any headhunters in the, uh, the room this afternoon. Um, I believe in uh, finding people that you uh, come across and keeping a black book and saying, there's somebody that I'd really like to hire. Um, <coughs> Probably the best example was uh, a guy that I recruited out of um, Boots in Nottingham. Uh, he'd worked as the, uh, the brand manager on uh, number seven. Uh, I met him at a mutual friend's birthday party in Nottingham. Uh, I didn't know him. Uh, I thought, this guy's pretty smart. Uh, made sure I got his contact details. Uh, knew that at the time, I couldn't afford to, uh, to hire him. But within a year, uh, thought I'll bring him in as business development director to the UK business. Uh, we only had a UK business at that point. Um, he proved that he did a good job running the, uh, the UK on new partnerships. After 12 months, uh, I promoted him to give him my job, which was the UK MD, so that then I could take a bigger role. And uh, uh, he worked for HomeServe for, um, for 12 years. And just on that, so you started this company. This is your baby of a company. How do you get into the style of delegating? 
because at the beginning you're doing everything. You're you're literally illustrating the leaflet that's going out. You're measuring the 3.8% coming back in. You're making sure that you've got the best 20 people in the business. How do you grow as a person to then say, actually, I will let go of that responsibility and let somebody else do it? Um, I think with difficulty to start with, we all find when uh, we're running a small business that you don't want to let go. Uh, but learn that if you have ambition and want to grow your business, then you do have to let go. Uh, but then it's about making sure that you've got the right people that you're delegating to. Uh, my biggest lessons in life and the biggest mistakes I've made have been uh, hiring uh, the wrong people and uh, letting somebody that was uh, really great in home serve go and keeping the wrong person. So that was a, uh, a double bad move. So it is all about people. And just on that, do you believe that you learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes? I, I think why Home Serve has been uh, successful so far is I've made lots of mistakes. So you do learn more from those. I think the key is try and make the mistakes as small as possible and don't make the same mistake again. Uh, but the people one was, um, uh, there was a guy that was working for me that was running our UK warranty business. It was the smaller part of our UK operation. And um, we tried to make a big acquisition, uh, which didn't quite happen. And uh, we didn't really have a role for him. I didn't have the courage to say, actually, I think you're great and you should run the whole of the UK. And uh, I let him go. And... Uh, he went on to um, buy Hastings Insurance for um, £20 million. Eight years later, he turned it into a business worth £2 billion, and he personally made £200 million, And uh, I've regretted losing him ever since. Uh, you can't look back at your uh, mistakes. Uh, so finally, I managed to get him back as a non-exec director on my main board. Uh, he came back two months ago. Uh, uh, he's going to add a lot of value in a non-exec capacity to, uh, to home serve and uh, I hope to persuade him that of his 200 million fortune he'd be well advised to invest at least 20 million of that in uh, buying home serve shares. Brilliant. What goes around comes around. He came back with a great big smile on his face. And uh, I told you so, Richard Harfin. Um, let's talk a bit about international because um, the party conferences have happened over the past few days. And, you know, there's lots of talk of Brexit, what's happening to the British economy. You have taken a move to say, let's continue to grow here, but let's look outside. Do you feel, well, first of all, I guess, why the ambition to go global? So why look outside the UK market? And in looking, has that presented you with kind of new challenges so is it a case of doing business in America is just like doing here but with a different accent or have you come across kind of other challenges yeah the um, so it's probably about seven years into home serve when uh, growth was doing well in the UK I started to think um, would the model work internationally and uh, at the time uh, we were still part of South Staff's water uh, they were 32 32% owned by um, General Dizot, the French water business. So I thought that would be a good idea. Let's go and talk to them and say, could we have a joint venture model like we did in uh, the UK in France? Um, it still took 18 months to get the deal, even though uh, they were shareholders in the, uh, in the group. Um, eventually, we got that deal in 2001. Uh, when people say, why did you pick France first? Uh, I joke and say it's the hardest business in the world to, um, uh, hardest country to do business in. And so if we can make it work in France, then that bodes well for, uh, for other countries. And after a year of trying, investing about two million pounds, uh, it didn't work. We'd listened to the French. We'd listened to um, General Dizot. Uh, they said that model in the UK won't work. We want uh, above the line advertising, posters, radio. Uh, we want to uh, have a new name 
we'd, we'd only use General Dezo as the uh, the brand on the uh, on the marketing. We want to use uh, the name Domio, uh, which was the name of the French business. Uh, I hated that name. It sounds more like pizza delivery than uh, plumbing insurance. And um, so the business um, failed in France after a year. Uh, but before we uh, we packed in because uh, I'm not a great believer in uh, packing anything in, uh, we said, why don't we go back to that original model in the UK, that cartoon leaflet, very simple, we'll put the water company brand on the front of it, and guess what? It worked. So we took a failing business to one that worked, where France today has a million customers, uh, and it makes um, 35 million euros profit, and was a role model for other countries. Um, but the big opportunity was in uh, 2003, uh, and that was going into uh, the US. Uh, one of my dreams and my original plan in uh, setting up a big business was to um, go to America, copy a business idea from over there, because generally I thought stuff happens there first, bring it back to the UK, and make it a, a big success here. So it was really interesting to find that uh, home assistance, plumbing insurance, uh, hadn't made it to America. That uh, it started in the UK, and therefore I could go to America and take a British model and try and make it work over there. And um, so we tried, and um, set up the business in uh, Miami, because that was where our insurer and our claims handling network was, uh, was based. Um, and hired a, uh, well, I took my, the guy from Boots who joined and ran the UK and said, uh, uh, got him into my office one day and said, uh, a great opportunity for you. I'd like you to go from running uh, the biggest operation in the UK to um, setting up in the, uh, in the US. I also love the fact, I know we've got some Nottingham people here that you said you're going from Nottingham to Miami. <laughs> I love Nottingham, but it's not Miami, is it? <laughs> so um, he agreed to do it. Um, I'm then a great believer in learning from others. And uh, I thought I need to find somebody that can help me uh, make the business work in the US. Ideally, they would be a Brit, but have uh, made a business work in a big way in the US. And the name I came across was uh, Nigel Morris. And he founded an American, he was a co founder of Capital One that started in the US before it came to the UK, the, uh, the credit card business. And um, uh, I pestered him until eventually he uh, agreed to see me. So I flew to Washington, D.C. Uh, I managed to get an hour with him. And I said, I've set this business up in the U.S., but uh, I want your help. And he said, OK, uh, I'll give you two bits of advice. Number one, if you want to run a serious business in the U.S., then uh, you need to base it somewhere between Boston and Washington, D.C., in the, uh, the northeast coast. And where were we? Miami. And guess what? We couldn't hire great American management because uh, they either wanted to smoke dope or go to the beach at four o'clock. So, they don't uh, do that in Nottingham. <laughs> so uh, I got the location wrong. So got the wrong management team. Secondly, he said, uh, if you want to be taken seriously as a proper American business, uh, you can't have a Brit running it, and I'd got a Brit running it. So the two basic uh, requirements, uh, I got both of them wrong. So uh, I listened to him, and we moved from Miami to Norwalk, Connecticut. That then meant that we could hire some really great Americans to, um, to run the business, because we probably got uh, four or five Brits out of the eight top roles. And that changed when we moved location. Uh, and then secondly, in 2011, I brought my uh, 
Brit back from running the US to rerun the UK and hired a great American uh, who's still with me six years later and has really been instrumental in growing that business from probably half a million customers when uh, uh, I hired him to today, the US is our biggest business, 3.1 million of our 8 million customers. So I got it very wrong in the US, but uh, took advice, listened, and that, uh, that worked. And you mentioned before, and it is incredible because the company is just kind of, it continues to grow. And you said when you were first hiring that you didn't think about the culture. It wasn't about, are they a good cultural fit? It's just, are they good people? How have you continued? Well, first of all, what is the home serve culture? Because you've got hundreds of people that you now employ, if not over a thousand. What is the culture and how do you still embody that culture when you've now got operations in US, Europe, UK? Yeah, I think it's um, being really clear about um, uh, actually the best way to do it is who are the people that fail in home serve because they're the wrong culture and then you can turn that into so therefore what are the sorts of people that we want to hire and the people that fail in home serve are they're political they are uh, they're not prepared to roll up the sleeves and get on and do the role they're big hirers of management consultants. Um, they uh, can't get into um, attention to detail. Uh, they're big company people rather than, uh, I really prefer smaller or medium sized uh, mentality people that uh, can then think big. So uh, that, those are the sorts of people that um, are really, really successful in, uh, in home serve. Uh, today we've got about 6,000 people in the business and uh, most people stay uh, a long time. Uh, my senior team of eight, most of them have been with me now for um, uh, six to 14 years. This is almost a terrible question to ask you, but could HomeServe exist without Richard Harpin? Um, I hope so. Uh, not yet, I hope, because... Uh, I think we've still got lots to achieve and um, uh, I read a book over Easter and uh, uh, I do lots of reading, uh, mainly business books and my team always then dread me coming back and say, oh, so what's next? And um, uh, this was the Airbnb story and uh, I came back and said, we've been at it for nearly 25 years. Uh, we're not global, we're only in five countries. We've still got one product set, which is Home Assistance Membership. And uh, our business is only worth 2.6 billion pounds. Uh, Airbnb is worth $30 billion and they've only been going eight years. So where have we gone wrong? And surely, with our experience, with a great top team, surely we can be global in eight years' time. We need to be dependent not on one product set, but on three or four products. And we too need to be worth 20 or 30 billion in eight years' time. So we have just written a growth eight plan and uh, setting out what we think we can achieve. Um, I agreed that at my group strategy day uh, here in the Midlands last week with my uh, group board. Uh, we're really excited about what we're going to achieve in the next eight years. And hopefully, uh, I'll stick around to um, help my team to uh, deliver it. But they're going to be the owners of it. My job is to um, steer them in the, uh, the right direction. And let me just ask you, I love the vision. Uh, similarly, when you told me about Airbnb, I think we had the same conversation that I feel the same about Amazon, that Amazon was started, it's worth billions, and in one man's lifetime, that's been achieved. Do you feel when you sit on a stage like this and say, I want my company to be worth 20 billion pounds in eight years time, etc.," do you feel you can honestly say that in Britain and get applauded for it as much as you would in America? In America, uh, and dare I say, you are a completely lovely audience. I can't help thinking if we'd been in the US when you'd have said that, there would have been a round of applause. 
And I just wonder, do you feel, you've been 25 years growing this business, is Britain celebrating its entrepreneurs as much as we should be when it comes to you very clearly with the profit motive of saying, I want to build a valuable company? Um, I don't think we do it in the UK as much as the Americans do. I love their uh, entrepreneurial uh, culture. Um, the, while we've got a, uh, an objective of how do we think as big as Airbnb, um, we don't talk about it in terms of what value we can achieve. Uh, I've learned a lesson which says, really, this is about uh, the main measures in, uh, in my business are um, how can we grow the number of members, because that's a really important measure. How do we li deliver outstanding customer service, because that's the moment of truth. And if we deliver that level of service, which we do in all of our businesses, then a lot of what we achieve is through word of mouth and it's a fantastic service you should join too. And if you deliver those things, uh, backed up by great employee engagement, uh, Home Serving the UK is the, uh, the UK's third best employer on uh, Glassdoor. Uh, we have a 83% engagement level in the UK business. And all of those things say if you deliver those, then out of that will come profit and shareholder value. But never put those two things first. They will come out of uh, delivering great service, great employee engagement, and uh, uh, delivering customer growth. And just on this, and it sounds like a detail point, we had an event on Friday where the former marketing director of Pret came to speak for us. And he put up a slide which showed where, how Pret measures success. And I thought it was really interesting that their number one measurement of success is how happy their own people are. So they put their own people's happiness before anything around food hygiene, customer service, the quality of the goods. Of course, all those things come. If you were asked to say one or two, would you put your people or your customers first? Which one would it be? I think it's equal. People do say if you've got really engaged staff then they will then deliver the uh, great customer service. Um, if you look at our bonus and incentive schemes, then uh, we incentivize the two very highly, but at the same level. Okay. All right, good. So let's just, um, I'm going to open up any minute now, but just the future uh, for HomeServe. So you're 24, 25 years old as a company. Um, how do you stay fresh when you're kind of that old as a company. So how do you keep the team motivated, keep the ideas coming, say kind of, right, we're on to our kind of next eight years. How do you keep that innovation flowing through the business? I, I think it's really tough for um, uh, large and medium companies. I'd put HomeServe in a, as a sort of medium-sized business today. Um, and what you find is that uh, you get complacency. We've got such a great model, why do we need to do anything else? Or um, trying to get innovation in the current business, and it's really difficult because uh, we do have red tape. We do make sure that we've got the right culture, that uh, we put in place governance and controls uh, for all the right reasons, uh, but that can stifle innovation. So uh, back in... Uh, about 2013 when I said we've got to get more innovation into the business because we need more than one product set, then uh, I copied um, AutoTrader. That's a business that uh, back in 2006, there was an Australian running the business called John King, Jonathan King. Um, he said, um, I don't think that selling cars in a printed magazine through news agents is going to be around forever. And I think we need to come up with a, an online model. And he said, the way we're going to do it is I'm going to hire a digital MD. We're going to set up new auto trader with the same name, but in a different location, different office, 100 miles away from our current magazine business. And we're going to give them a bit of money and say, sell cars online. And uh, so we got this team that started selling cars online. And they were uh, placing ads online for £15. And the people in the old print 
business said, you can't do that. We're selling an ad in our magazine for 60 quid. So you've got to stop those new people from, uh, from doing that. And he said, oh, no, I'm not, because if we don't do it to ourselves, somebody else will. And guess what happened? Three years ago, the print magazine closed, and Auto Trader today is worth four billion pounds. It makes net profit margins of 67%, and uh, it's a great success story. So I took that model, and we set up a home serve shed in London, not in our uh, UK Walsall business, and said, um, come up with something around smart home and look at how we beat British gas on boiler installations. Um, out of that came a, an innovation which is called LeakBot, which is a clip-on water leak detector. Um, we've proved it, we've got a UK patent, and it sells to UK home insurers. It solves uh, damage following escape of water, a 660 million pound problem for insurers in the UK alone, a multi-billion problem for home insurers worldwide, and uh, we're gonna roll that model out uh, globally from next year. Uh, secondly, uh, we expect that we're going to install more boilers in the UK in three years' time than the 100,000 that British Gas do. And both of those uh, ideas came out of our um, UK innovation unit. So the key bit is um, innovation is hard. Uh, do it in a separate part of your business with a separate team. Um, also go and buy businesses. Um, so we bought a shareholding in a business called Tado, which is a German smart thermostat business. Um, the part of the model that I'm most excited by, which is why you should uh, rush out and buy home serve shares uh, tomorrow morning, um, is uh, home experts. So this is our idea of a global digital platform uh, like uh, Uber or Airbnb or Just Eat, or Right Move, uh, but for getting a local tradesman for home improvement. So uh, we've speeded up that model by buying a big shareholding in Checker Trade in the UK. Anybody use Checker Trade? How was the service? Good? I, I love the fact you're asking your audience. Come on, let's have a bit more than that. <laughs> uh, we bought a similar business in... Uh, uh, Palma Mallorca that operates in nine markets, including Latin America, called Habitissimo. And we're figuring out how we can make those businesses even better, and then we will scale that business globally. So the message is uh, innovation through uh, separate units, through acquisition, but you've got to make it happen. Uh, don't just leave it to your, um, your current business. Uh, the Google search guys, don't say come up with innovation in the search business, they set it up separately and that's what works. Absolutely, in a separate business. Okay, uh, questions for Mr. Harpin on all things. I haven't asked him anything yet about money, not his own personal money, but funding for the company. Uh, questions on that or anything else? Sir, oh, I was going to say, I'm going to wait until a hand goes up because I know that you can't not have questions. Do you mind just shouting? <laughs> Did everybody hear that? Uh, so the, what is the appetite for raising money in the UK compared with other places? And, and maybe also, if you're happy, just to tell us how you have funded the expansion of HomeServe. Yeah, um, I think uh, when you're making a lot of money and you don't need us as much, then banks will rush over themselves to, uh, to lend you the money. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, we were generating, uh, as well as paying significant dividends to our shareholders, sort of 60 or 70 million a year. Uh, we got about 100 million pounds spare. 
So uh, we gave it back to shareholders. We did a one-off special dividend and 100 million went back to them. Uh, we uh, do buy quite a few businesses as well as organic growth. And uh, we did a big deal in the US last year, uh, bought our main competitor for uh, $75 million. Uh, we want to do uh, more acquisitions. So uh, today we have a panel of six banks and a uh, facility of 300 million. Uh, if we needed more money, we would go and issue shares. As a public company, uh, we've never asked our shareholders for uh, 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 m money through a uh, share placing, but uh, at the right time, uh, we could one day do that. Um, I think it's tough for small businesses to raise money. I think a lot of small businesses got badly burnt uh, a few years ago by uh, banks that were calling in their money and all those horror stories. Uh, I think that's got a bit better. Uh, I think it's great to be able to uh, have crowdfunding, uh, borrow money from family and uh, friends is a good source of finance. Uh, try and make sure that you've got a business model that's working, that's generating a bit of profit, uh, but then reinvest that profit back in, uh, in future growth. Lovely. All right. There's the question on money. Uh, question? I thought you were going to say, are you going to buy them? So sorry again for those at the back. It's, it's not the most conducive place to have intimate Q&A, but the question was, um, across the road, there's a whole line of Monarch aeroplanes, of course, sitting redundant. And the question was, what would Richard have done differently? I, I guess it's always uh, easy with the benefit of hindsight, isn't it, now that they, um, uh, they've gone bust. I, I think probably the learning was they didn't quite know what their purpose or their unique strategy was. And they went from, are we a package holiday company or could we now compete with the low cost airlines? Uh, love them or hate them, uh, Ryanair are very focused on what they do, EasyJet are as well. Uh, and I think Monarch sort of said, well, we're sort of, we want to be a, a bit of Thomas Cook and do the package holiday bit. And we want to do a bit of the Ryanair and EasyJet. And they were neither sort of one nor the other, trying to do both. And I don't think that works as um, uh, the business going bust has uh, proved. Uh, I think it was pretty clear that the nail was in the coffin probably uh, six or nine months ago when uh, they hired in consultants to, uh, to ask uh, ask them what their strategy should uh, should be. I love the fact you are a former consultant yourself. So this is someone who used to work at Deloitte, but you do seem to have this absolute angst against hiring in consultants, because I agree. I guess what you're saying is the management should know themselves. Do we have any management consultants in the audience? Okay, few. And even if you were, you're not going to admit it now, are you? Uh, final question from the audience before I have a final little one. This is your one and only time to get a question to this man. Henry. Um, what's your, I guess, your internal monologue? So when you wake up in the morning and you think about the challenges and the opportunities, like, and you think about the sector you're in, like, what's driving you? Is it passion? Is it dedication to your customers? Like, what's, what's the story inside your head? Did everybody hear that? Uh, it was beautifully said, actually. But the question is, what is the internal monologue inside your head when you wake up each morning? That... Uh, most entrepreneurs uh, give in at some stage and cash out and bank the money. And uh, I'm not a big believer in that. I think that uh, if you've got something that uh, been very lucky and uh, uh, that luck has turned into quite a big business, and uh, I think stick with it because uh, it's bigger than I ever thought it would be. Uh, I do think one day HomeServe can be a, uh, a recognized global brand for uh, being the most trusted provider of home improvements and repairs that uh, I need to stick with it until uh, I've seen that happen. And it's going to take us another eight years to deliver that. And uh, if you look at where do businesses really escalate in terms of value, then there are quite a few examples of businesses that only make it big uh, in, their, uh, in the third decade. 
Uh, can anybody tell me how old Apple were when they invented the, uh, the iPhone? Uh, they were 30 years old. So uh, had Steve Jobs sort of packed it all in, I know that he got fired and then came back again, but if he'd sort of given up after year 25, then uh, uh, the world might never have had uh, the iPhone or the tablet uh, or the Apple Watch. And uh, so I think it's really important that um, there's a duty to say, uh, if you've got a uh, great opportunity, then uh, stick with it. Uh, I was going to ask a final question, but I just think that's a lovely note to end on because it just feels as if you're saying, I've been going for 25 years. It's worked out pretty well. I would find it interesting that you use the word lucky, where I actually think there's been huge amounts of hard work and kind of thinking. And yet you're kind of like, we're just starting. We've got an eight year plan. We're going to continue to grow. I am going to give back as I continue to do this. So it's, I don't know, I feel like the journey is continuing. And we have got books, which is the Home Serve story. Do you want to just quickly say anything about that just before we complete? Yeah, Our we um, uh, originally put this book together about um, uh, when we, for our uh, 20th anniversary, uh, so gave one to the probably sort of uh, three and a half thousand people in the business at that stage, uh, updated a couple of years ago. Uh, and this was saying uh, it's really important to look back at all the mistakes that you've made, some of the successes as well. And so that was the purpose of the, uh, the book sort of uh, setting out uh, where we'd got to uh, as a uh, internal reminder. Uh, I'm a great believer in uh, learning from uh, some of those lessons and maybe just pick out uh, a few to finish with. Um, so I would say second mover advantage, copy others because if somebody else has done it, then copy and improve on it and that's much better than trying to invent something uh, yourself. Uh, persistence pays. So uh, hopefully that's the message. Stick with it. The business that we bought in the US last year, uh, our biggest competitor, those guys came to uh, the West Midlands in 2006. And we tried to buy the business then. We walked away from trying to buy it in 2009. And we finally made the deal happen last year. So it took 10 years, but that was our best ever deal. So uh, stick with it. Um, uh, get really focused. Um, how many of you here this afternoon have a to-do list? Um, how many of you have a not-to-do list? So really important that you say, what are the things that I'm not going to do? Uh, Emma, in running... No, oh, uh, no, don't. This is why I just looked at Helen Booth. Enterprise Boone. Nation, so uh, a great model in supporting lots of businesses, uh, in helping government. Uh, fantastic. But think about what are the jewels in the crown of, what are the bits that you should be putting even more focus on? Uh, what are the bits you should be saying, well, actually, that's a small part of what, we'll, what we do today, and let's stop doing that. So I think, think the same. What are the bits that actually they're not adding the value and you should uh, stop doing? So uh, there's probably almost a book for uh, everyone. So everyone please do, the whole uh, show. <laughs> please do uh, take a copy of the Home Serve story and hope you learn uh, something from it. Uh, secondly, if you don't have a Home Serve policy, then uh, you'll be going home tonight to a big... Uh, uh, emergency and you'll regret not having a policy so go online to homeserve.com and uh, buy one and thirdly if you really think the home service only just started this is the beginning I do think it is the be is the beginning and we're going to uh, take over the world in the next eight years then uh, you should go and buy some shares tomorrow but I would remind you that shares can go down as well as up thank you very much Richard Harpin Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I do feel the show is kind of like closing around us, but I think uh, there are drinks, Dave, to the, to the right. Uh, 
networking and drinking to the right. Uh, you've been wonderful. And yes, uh, let's just once more time show our appreciation for the excellent Mr. Richard Harpin. <laughs>